thank you for joining us. Uh, I just realized when I muted. Um, we're going to have a conversation today that I'm really excited to have um, because with everything that has been so busy since the fall, I have had not had enough of a chance to um, have more in-depth conversations with people that that uh, are important to me. And so I want to introduce um, Rabbi May Yi, who is FOR's 2023-2024 Wink, uh, Walter Wink and June Keener Wink Fellow. Um, for anybody that doesn't know about Fellowship of Reconciliation's Wink Fellowship, it's awarded annually to students or emerging faith leaders focused on nonviolence or whose work creates change and challenges power. Uh, the Walter Wink and June Keener Wink Fellowship honors the life and legacy of FOR member Walter Wink um, and the ongoing transformational work of his wife, June Keener Wink. Together, Walter and June prepared a generation of peace leaders, pastors, theologians, um, LGBTQ plus rights and scholars activists to engage the left and right sides of our brain in the pursuit of peace and to take the risks that are necessary to make peace happen. And um, so rather than reading a bio of Maze, I would really love to just dive into conversation, which is uh, a frequent way that I uh, like to do stuff. Um, and uh, oh, maybe you need to sorry. unmute yourself and uh, then I'd like to join us this afternoon. Hey there. A, a conversation starter. Oh. I wanted the to speak. All right. I'm going to mute all and then Jay, if you can unmute. Okay. Great. Hi. Welcome. So um, I just want to start with uh, I was talking to you a little while ago and uh, you said to me that you have since you've stopped asking people how they're doing um with this uh genocide taking place in front of our eyes in, in gaza and that that stuck out to me so much and in fact i've adopted that because you know i was otherwise like asked kind of apologetically how are you and I started asking, how is your heart doing? So um, I'll start with asking you that today. How is your heart doing today, May? Yeah. Um, I texted a friend this morning and I said, it just keeps getting worse and worse. Um, and I think I move in and out of feelings of despair these days, no matter how many hours I put being on the streets and shutting things down and calling elected officials and talking to people. Being this many months into a genocide and you know, I th I think only beginning to see the cracks show. Um, my heart is tired. <laughs> um, yeah. So to give a little background for everybody, when uh, we brought Rabbi mm -hmm. on as our Wink Fellow, uh, she and I had talked about, we talked about different uh, projects that she might do while well, uh, in, in the time of her fellowship. And we talked about exploring the concept of rest and the need for rest. And we talked about um, doing a, a Shabbat weekend, Stony Point Center, and then, I'll get, then October 7th happened. And after that, the, uh, the death toll hasn't stopped climbing and um, Rabbi May's fellowship immediately turned from the work uh, from that kind of work to um, the her, to her body of work being what I think of so much as as may your body being in handcuffs and um, at events and rallies and and all kinds of things could you 
talk a bit about what you've been doing um, since this started. Yeah, I mean, I've come to embody the understanding that um, business cannot go on as usual. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the term emergency yeah. and thinking that, you know, when I grew up as a child, my parents taught me what to do in an emergency and they taught me to stay calm. And I don't think at that point in my life I ever could comprehend that emerg that an emergency lasted for months. And that's where we are right now. That's where I find myself in this moment is in the fifth month of an emergency. And when you're in emergency, when you're in an emergency, you don't rest. When the death toll is climbing by the thousands, you I I can't get myself out of the streets. Um, and when I talk about the streets, I talk about shutting them down. I talk about bringing every single person's attention to what is happening so that every single person can join forces and do what they can to stop this genocide. Um, for me, doing what I can has meant um, participating in nonviolent direct action and civil disobedience. I have shut down Congress and train stations and bridges and streets. I've met with elected officials um, on the Hill most recently and at their local offices. Some of those were attempts. Some of those were actual meetings. Um, and, and as you say, I've, I've been in and out of jail for the past uh, five months. I had never been arrested prior to uh, sometime in, in late October. And now I'm uh, quite well acquainted with one police plaza in New York City. Um, and yeah, I also locally, I live in Connecticut. Um, have found myself speaking at many rallies. And simultaneously, when I'm not in the spotlight with cameras in my faces and microphones in my face, I am still working as a rabbi, <laughs> which uh, is, is a lot. Um, for those of you who don't know, I was ordained in May of 2023, so almost a year ago at this point. Um, I'm the first Chinese-American rabbi to be ordained in the Reconstructionist movement, um, and I'm one of, of really a handful of explicitly anti-Zionist rabbis. So when October 7th hit, all of a sudden I had an influx of messages from anti-Zionist Jews in my inbox, specifically from anti-Zionist Jews of color who had no one else to talk to. Um, and meanwhile, I'm, I'm rabbiing a community here in New Haven, Connecticut, where I live and serve the community of Mending Minion. Um, and so it's been, it's been a time of of yeah like holding so much um holding community holding grief holding rage um and just yeah both like pouring myself into the movement into the streets um and creating space to hold right creating space to hold people's like wide vast range um of emotions and i i asked this somewhat for myself as well because um this is something that's i it, since october 7th it's been been very difficult for me to um to practice shabbat and to feel 
the desire to do that or um, to kind of lean into and be a part of, of my faith. And I wonder um, both how that's been for you personally, especially as a rabbi um, and knowing, you know, sometimes I, I can describe this as like uh, the, the literal language that's being spoken um, by those committing genocide is the same like is well relatively the same language that we pray with and the symbols our symbols are um plastered on tanks and missiles and, and so on and so what has that been like for you as a rabbi and for those that um in your congregation both both uh, amending minion and and broader yeah i mean this is a moment in which i've had many people perhaps a majority of people come to me and say i don't want to be jewish anymore i've heard that from lay people i've heard that from clergy i've heard that from rabbis in training um I, I think to say that it's painful to witness what's happening in our name as Jews would be an understatement. Um it's what's happening in our name as Jews, but but let me add to that, right? We're not all Jews on this call, I, I don't imagine. And what's happening in our names as American taxpayers, as people who live in the cities and the states where the bombs are being built. I live in Connecticut, which, which is one of the top producers of weapons in, in this country. So yeah, my conscience as a Jew is heavy, um, but that's not necessarily removed from my conscience as a human being who lives in this country and pays taxes in this country. Um, you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard to be a rabbi in this moment, right? Like, frankly, it's, it's hard to be my best self. I was just ordained a rabbi. And now I'm thrown into this world where like, I feel like I'm being hit with the heaviest existential questions, you know, that I could be hit with in my career. Um, you know, and, and really the most I can say to people is that your feelings are valid, right? You're, you're wanting to, to, to disconnect, to flee. It makes sense. Like, yes, of course. Right. Like to me, the best thing that I can do as a rabbi for my people, for Jews and congregants and, and for Palestine, I, I think is just, is to bear witness in, in whatever way that means at whatever time and in whatever situation, right? Like I bear witness to Jewish pain and suffering and um, to the ways that we're seeing it be co-opted. Um, and I bear witness to the unfathomable horrors and tragedy that we're seeing unfold in a genocide in Gaza. And I, you know, I say, open, open your eyes with me, right? Like we all need to um, take action in, in the ways that we can. And, you know, I just want to clarify, I talk a lot about, you know, putting our bodies on the line. Um, and, you know, I, I want to lift up that that means different things for different people. Um, not all of us can physically put our bodies on the line. But when we can't do that, maybe we can have hard conversations with loved ones and with colleagues. Maybe we can make phone calls to elected officials. Um, there, there are a plethora of things that we can be doing to... Um, to stop business as usual, right? And to bring everyone's attention to the matter. Um, 
And I want to say that I do deeply believe that it is upon all of us. Um, yeah, and then in terms of how how I relate to my Judaism in this moment, to the rituals, to Shabbat, I mean, I, I wrestle with them more than ever is the way that I engage. Um, for some years now, I've observed the Jewish high holidays in the Palestine Museum, right? So I'm not, I'm not unfamiliar with this wrestling. I'm not unfamiliar with praying the same prayers that Israeli settlers are praying while blocking entrances to Palestine. I do that on Yom Kippur in the, inside of the Palestine Museum with my community. But yeah, this, this, I, I think the like ongoingness of this and, and the, just like how extremely brutal this has been for five months feels feels different than past moments um and and we know that this is you know this did not start on october 7th this is this has been going on for 75 years um and these last five months feel different feel heavier feel catastrophic um you know, and and God willing, all I can say is that I I I see people's eyes opening right now. I see I see the tides turning, and they need to turn faster, right? Like they need to have have turned already. Um. So. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to um, diverge from this uh, direction for a moment. And um, if you could tell us about your journey to become a rabbi. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it's not completely disconnected because I became a rabbi because I care deeply about Palestinian liberation and I care deeply about the role that my people have played, my people, the Jewish people, um, have played in the oppression, in the occupation of the Palestinian people. And through, through my own experiences in the Jewish world um, and through facing racism and discrimination, I, I, I one time asked myself, well, you know, how, how, how do I, um, how, how do I do what I want to do and get taken seriously? Um, you know, it's funny, there, there are so many ways that I, that I tell my story about how I came to become a rabbi. Um, I feel like I have a slightly different version for different audiences. Um, yeah, but at the crux of it, I, I became a rabbi because I wanted to be a Jewish voice, a Chinese American Jewish voice, a rabbinic Jewish voice for Palestinian liberation. You know, and and today it's you know one of the most important things to me to be an explicitly anti-Zionist rabbi. Um, and we see the numbers of anti-Zionist rabbis growing. We see the you know, a number of anti-Zionist Jews growing and the number of anti-Zionist Jews who are searching, right, and seeking anti-Zionist rabbis and community. They are seeking um, community that's not a Jewish community that's not afraid to name what's happening as a genocide. Um, they're searching for community to wrestle with, you know, how how these things happen in the world. Um, and so that's that's why I became a rabbi. I didn't want to be silenced anymore for, for being who I am. Um, and it, it's kind of a miracle that someone <laughs> like me with the politics that I have was, was able to get through the program. 
Um, it was not always a given. And I've learned more information recently that really, I, um, it was not a given up until the last moment. Um, apparently my school was receiving calls from the local Jewish Federation telling them not to ordain me. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm relieved to be on the other side. And, and to indeed be a rabbi for Palestinian liberation, as I sought out to do seven years ago. You told me a story when um, we were first meeting about your process of becoming a rabbi that that uh, that shocked me, though I, I you would think I wouldn't be so easily shocked anymore these days, but uh, still am um, about your, uh, first of all, that the requirement that you study in Israel and about your experiences there. Um, yeah, so as far as I know, all um, rabbinical schools require a length of time of study in Israel. Um, most programs require a full year. That was the requirement when I began rabbinical school. It eventually got cut down to one semester and eventually got cut down to one summer. So we see the direction um, this is going. Though I um, did not complete my required period of, of time of study in Israel because I you know, wrote a petition to say that it's not safe for me to go to the state of Israel. And I actually um, don't believe that with my profile, and my, you know, my um, adhering to the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement, my explicit being an anti-Zionist that I would be allowed in the country. Um, you know, actually, according to the Israeli state, you're not allowed into the country if you support BDS. So I said, you know, you're actually, you're telling me to go to this country illegally. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to do that. Um, unfortunately, conscientious objection is not a valid reason to not um, study in Israel. But um, I, I was able to make this case. Nonetheless, I um, did end up studying in Israel the summer before I began rabbinical school. And that is because I started rabbinical school with so little knowledge uh, that the school said, you need to learn Hebrew and study Jewish text this summer if you want to start rabbinical school right away. And the only place um, in the world that I could do that um, to study text and language at the same time over the course of a summer was, was Israel. So I... Um, I, I did end up going it and just to like flesh out this piece of you know I didn't know anything I grew up in a secular home it was only as a rabbinical student that I experienced my first Shabbat um, that I experienced my first Rosh Hashanah and that was from the bima from the pulpit um, same same thing with my first Yom Kippur was from the bima um I experienced my first Passover Seder as a rabbinical student. I really didn't have a lot of um, Jewish experiences. And that's because I grew up secular. That's because when I got to undergrad and was trying to get involved in Jewish life, I experienced racism that precluded me from um, being involved in Jewish spaces. Um, so, yeah, but I did do that. Um, that one summer of study in in Israel, which which was challenging. I'm gonna bring my colleague and uh, fellow troublemaker, uh, Susan, into this um, conversation. Um, Susan and I have both been uh, in touch with May since um, she started uh, being a part of Fellowship of Reconciliation. And I know, Susan, you have some um, questions and, and thoughts. Yeah, um, uh, Rabbi May, I have uh, one question from myself, and then I'm going to pull one question from the chat. And the question I have from myself is, um, I remember uh, back in July, um, you and I took a road trip up to see June Keener Wink in uh, Massachusetts. And you were a um, relatively new rabbi, a new um, new uh, 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 Walter and June Keener Wing fellow. 
And um, you were telling me about your 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 work and your vision for um, uh, educating around the concept of the Sabbath. And I remember that uh, so well, and it, it was it was new to me in the way you described the Sabbath as um, not just a day of rest, uh, as as um, decreed in in the Hebrew Bible, but also um, it means passing the torch. So my question to you, as as I hear you in deep pain, and I think probably all of us on this call can resonate with this pain that we never feel that we're doing enough. And I can't even imagine what it is to be Jewish and feel that I'm not doing enough, um, which is a, an added burden. But I, I wanted to ask you, what does looking, what does passing the torch look like to you um, on, on the ground these days? And then maybe if you could tie into the answer into a question in the chat, um, which is from Don Jones. And he asks um, a rudimentary but complicated question. What does anti-Zionist mean? And, and what does that mean for Israel? Yeah, well, I can take the last question first. I mean, uh, my mentor is Rabbi Brant Rosen, the founding rabbi of Tzedek Chicago, the first explicitly anti-Zionist synagogue in the country based in, in Chicago. And I, I will never forget when, when Brandt said this to me because it was so simple. And he says, Angela Davis says, you can't be not racist. You can't be non-racist. What does that mean? You have to be anti-racist, right? You have to be against, actively against the system of oppression. That's what it means to be anti-Zionist. Right, I, you know, one could go into a much longer philosophical and theoretical um, analysis and definition, but I I prefer to keep things to keep things simple, right? Um, to me, it's it's taking a position in opposition to um, to a system, right? In in Walter's words, to a power in opposition to a power that is destructive. Um. In terms of the other question, I mean, you know, I would just shout out my comrades, the people that I that I am in the streets with all the time. I mean, my the person that I've been arrested the most times with and in jail with the most times with, oftentimes on Shabbat is is Jewish, right? Um, yeah, um, I think I also want to lift up a story from a recent action that I was at because it was kind of a breaking point for me, perhaps in a good way, <laughs> um, since uh, since October 7th. Um, and, I, and I think it speaks to the power of, of camaraderie and the community that I've been in the streets with. Um, you know, and again, I say in the streets broadly, we've also been, you know, shutting things down that are not streets. Um, but... I suppose it was earlier this month. Um, some of you may have um, been trying to watch the State of the Union address, and you may have been expecting it to come on the air at 9 p.m. as it was scheduled for, um, and you may have noticed that it did not come on the air at 9 p.m. Um, and that was my fault, <laughs> and the fault of 250 other comrades who shut down Pennsylvania Avenue and blocked the president's motorcade. Um, and I, I was fully expecting to be arrested that night. Um, and I actually was expecting a pretty long arrest because of how many open cases I have at this point in time. And at one point, um, a person from our jail support team came around and tapped me on the shoulder and said, arrest will be starting soon. I said, okay, great. I'm prepared. I'm ready. Um, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be staying put. Thanks, thanks for the notice. Um, but then the protest went on and it went on and we kept chanting and we kept listening to speeches and testimony from movement leaders and from Palestinians and the arrest never came. 
And at a certain point, Lone Tran, um, a movement leader from Rising Majority, you know, said, okay, friends, we've, we've completely, you know, we've succeeded. We've, you know, our purpose for coming here, we, we did it. Um, and, and, and Lone said, we're going to safely disperse now. And at that point, I watched the paddy wagons close their doors and drive away. And we stayed in those streets. <laughs> we told them we were going to leave, but we stayed. And it really erupted into what felt to me like a block party. And at another moment, you know, my, my timeline is a, is a little bit confused, but um, in, in a similar portion of, of the rally, um, a leader from the U.S. campaign for Palestinian rights um, started leading us in a chant. And it's the chant, I believe that we will win. And I realized that for the first time in five months, I actually believed those words. Um, those, yeah, those words like really started like soaking into my body. Um, and I remember finally when we when we did end up dispersing and I stepped and I stepped onto the sidewalk, I just looked at my friend and I said, I I feel joy for the first time in five months. Right. I've, like I've, you know, like really been in in not a good place. I was like, you know, I don't I don't I don't think anyone has been for for five months and and um you know, so so Susan, going back to your question, right? Like it's it's that it's the power of solidarity and community, um, the power of being led so strongly in in leading that chant. I believe that we will win. Looking behind me, seeing this enormous Palestinian flag, hearing the voices of two hundred and fifty people, you know, behind me chanting that. At, at one point, I think we started like jumping up and down and like, it felt like a block party, right? It was like, we were like, all right, we're not getting arrested. You know, we're getting reports that, you know, Biden hasn't left the White House yet, that, you know, we're live streamed on CNN with a split screen of an empty podium. Um, and, you know, just, just to bring in another question that I'm asked all the time of like, you know, May, how are you finding joy in these moments? I don't, I like never can answer that question. I'm like, I can't engage with that question, but, but really the answer for me in that moment was like, that's, that's how, right. Like believing in my body that, that I I really believe that we will win and, and seeing and seeing the cracks, like finally, like five months in, you know, our elected officials and, and Biden and Harris are finally using the word ceasefire, not in the way I want them to, right? And it's totally a political move, you know, because of the election, because of Ramadan. But nonetheless, I'm like, the cracks are showing that we've gotten to this point, um, you know, and I think when I stepped onto the sidewalk and said to my friend, I feel joy for the first time um, in, in five months, you know, even if only for, for a moment, I think the cracks were also beginning to show in my despair that I have been feeling. And so I, I wish that, um, I wish that to all of us that, you know, as, as we see the cracks, um, towards, towards justice, that we can also find cracks, um, in, in the despair that, that some of us, um, may be feeling. And, you know, if if the place that we find joy is by chanting, I believe that we will win in the streets, then like, let's take that joy. Let's let's take um, let, let's take what we can get. You may, you know, you you uh, you come up against the U.S. powers that be and also the Jewish institutional Jewish American institutional I should say powers that be, which is much more than just the philosophy or, or just the practice of Zionism, it is well-structured and um, forceful. Could you describe it if you see cracks there and um, where you see that going? Yeah, I mean, the, the cracks are there. I mean, the fact that we're hearing the word ceasefire 
um, you know, that feels huge. I mean, yeah, I mean, I remember when only a handful of people had called for a ceasefire back in October when I shut down the Cannon House Congress building on the Hill. Um, so, so that's where, so that's where I see, well, that's where I see a crack, you know, where I see our politicians finally being like, all right, we can't ignore them. We've been ignoring them. We can't anymore. Um, and I see the cracks showing in the Jewish institution, um, because they're they're really having to to wrestle and and reckon with this. I mean, the amount of people that have been fired um, because of being outspoken against the genocide and because of being anti-Zionist. And I'm like, Jewish community, you're losing us. Like, you're firing us. We're we're leaving our jobs. Um, I, I think this really is a moment of of reckoning. Um, and in addition to that, as I said earlier, just so many people are waking up um, to and and wrestling with the lies and the propaganda that that many Jews grew up with. Um, and that they're, you know, you know, not only beginning to unlearn, but having to confront, you know, <laughs> head on right now. And where I see this going, I mean, you know, this this is a hard question, right? And and it's and it's where I, I feel torn between despair and, and between hope. And like I'm I'm not gonna stop fighting. And, you know, I I'm terrified that, you know, this genocide will be, will be, you know, continue until it's, e until it's end. Um, and I, and I worry about what it will take for Gaza to rebuild, you know, as Palestine, not as new settlements. Um, I, Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. I, you know, frankly, I don't have a perfect answer beyond to follow my heart, which just says like, keep, keep fighting like hell, keep, keep fighting for life. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a politician. I'm not a policy person. Um, but what I can do and what I know is that I can follow my heart. I can follow my morals. I can follow, follow my values. Um, and I can be in community with Palestinians and I can listen to their voices and I can heed their calls. Um, and, you know, we can work together with all that we have. The more of us, the more powerful we are um, to, to end the violence, to, um, to save lives and, and to rebuild, right? It, it doesn't end at stopping the violence, right? There's, you know, and unfathomable amount of healing right and rebuilding that that has to happen for for generations to come um so yeah i mean, I, I, I so appreciate you being in this conversation right now when when there are not answers to so much right and um hope is fleeting in those in those moments um where was I going with that? Oh, <laughs> I recall. So, you know, I I know that I often live in a bubble, right? <laughs> you know, because I'm I'm surrounded by so many like-minded people, and I see um the Jewish anti-Zionist movement growing rapidly. But I also know that we are still a small percentage of American Jews. We're still very much a minority. And you know, if we were to look at Israeli Jews that um, are fighting for Palestinian liber liberation, that number is can practically be counted on two hands. It's so small. Where do you see um, the Jewish people? I, I want to say, like, I don't want to say the future of Judaism as a religion, but I, I guess I'll ask what 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 I'm often grappling with in the middle of the night um, when I feel like I can't do Shabbat how do we come back from this when it ends because again as you said right like I mean first nothing happens until we stop the bombs which isn't even bare you know which is only one piece of the violence but how do we come back from this as a people as a 
yeah, I mean, I think we need to keep talking to each other. I think we need to keep listening and learning and pushing, right? And teaching and educating. And um, it's hard, hard work, but holding space for people um, as they're in these processes of, of transformation. Um, I mean, we, we move forward by, by bringing others along. To, to me, that's the only way. Um, and we, we can all find ourselves along different parts of that journey, right? For, for me, I, I really see my place um, in the movement as like being a rabbi for anti-Zionists. Um, there are other rabbis who see themselves serving the, that open tent um, more, right? And, and serving people um, of, of all walks of life, of all walks of um, political spectrum in Judaism. Um, there are there are people who really see themselves as um, being able to to be with people, you know, at that cusp um, of transition from unlearning Zionism into into anti-Zionism. And and we need all of us. Um, we need all of us, and to all of us to be moving to to the left, um, to the same direction. Um, to the direction of of liberation for Palestinians um, and and for everyone between every river and and every sea. Thank you, Susan. Do you want to jump in with any questions, either of your own or from the chat? Well, from the chat, um, we have a comment from a longtime uh, FOR member. Uh, uh, Paul Dakar and writer uh, Leonard Cohen. There's a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets in. And we have um, a question uh, from. I see one right there from Janet Gray. Uh, yes, but that's something that that stands out for me too. Um, um, the yes, Janet how... would like to. Yeah, please go, go ahead. <laughs> All right, I'll go. <laughs> how your religious faith sustains your activism, and and I was thinking in my head as well. So I was going, I was planning on asking, are there any passages or psalms or uh, particular prayers that give you strength in these times? Um. Yes and no, right? Our, our tradition is a complicated one. I think um, there's a text that's been lifted up a lot recently that, that talks about, you know, to, to save one life is to save the whole world. But if you look at that text closely, it says that to save one Jewish life is to save the whole world. And um, we extrapolate from that. So... That's that's oftentimes how I relate to, to the religion, right? Like, um, I I lean into the ways that we open it up and broaden it and extrapolate from it and wrestle with the ways in in which it's where it's narrow, um, and and where it's harmful. Um, you know what else I would say is that singing really helps me. Um, there's a lot of songs in our tradition, nigunim, which are wordless melodies. Most often in the streets, I, I end up singing the chants more so than than screaming them. It also helps my voice. <laughs> I give that to you all as a, as a tool too. If you're in the streets, um, put those chants to to some sort of form of of melody. Um, it'll it'll help your voice. Um, yeah, but but really, you know. I, I, you know, I, I am a rabbi and like, I, I feel like I also have to say that it's, it's hard right now. It's hard. And it makes sense that people want to be stepping away. And all, all I can do is say like, I'm here in it and I'm here in it, like struggling in it and questioning in, in it. Um, and, you know, w when I have the spoons, you know, searching, searching for comfort in it, but, um, 
you know, my, my time for rest and introspection um, is, is minimal, is minimal these days. Um, Um, so FOR, we're a interfaith or multi-faith organization. And um, I, I'm wondering, um, have there been any particular, and, and recognizing that the Palestinian communities that, uh, you know, are, are, there are historic Jewish Palestinian communities, but, um, you know, we're largely, we're talking Muslim and Christian. And um, if there have been specific um, reaching across lines of faith that have been inspiring or meaningful or effective uh, for you that you've witnessed? Um, for sure. I mean, most all the spaces that I'm in are um, multi-faith. Um, you know, I'm very often with the Palestinians. I'm very often with um, faith leaders um, of different backgrounds. And, and that's important, right? It's important for us to be, um, yeah, seeking that, you know, the, the phrase another world is possible to, to, be, to be believing in that and building that. Um, I feel very inspired to see Christians finally um, speaking up and, and um, wrestling with Christian Zionism. Um, yeah, I there's there's a lot of collaboration in in terms of there's like a new interfaith coalition um, in Connecticut that, that I've had a few meetings with um, when we've met with elected officials. Um, you know, but actually now now that I'm you know rambling. There's there have been a few very meaningful conversations that I've had with Black Christian clergy in the South, mm. specifically in Atlanta, who reached out to JVP and said, um, do y'all have some anti-Zionist rabbis that we can talk to? Because these rabbis down here that we've been doing movement work with for years are saying to us that we're disowning them because we're not standing with Israel and like, what's happening what's happening like we need to know that um you know standing with palestine is not disowning our jewish community um and and we've now had a number of conversations and are and are um maintaining a relationship and i think that that is a very um important relationship um that i that i've been building and and i'm grateful for Did you have something? If not, I will go on in the meantime. Um, I have a couple announcements for uh, people who want to contribute to creating cracks. Um, one is uh, Holy Week, um, which is next week. Uh, and it's a pilgrimage um, in Philadelphia, the length of Gaza that ends up um, at Lockheed Martin, and um, there, I put the link in the chat. Um, the lead organizer is uh, Red Letter Christians, along with FOR, um, uh, rabbis uh, for ceasefire, and, and a number um, in the in the uh, multi faith uh, community. And um, feel free to join um, at each step or all steps. But uh, the primary action at Lockheed Martin. Um, will be on Friday, and um, it will be a, an act of uh, resistance, uh, nonviolent civil disobedience, or as our, our former um, our former Bayer Drustin fellow called it, militant nonviolent civil disobedience. Uh, there will be an escalation, and um, you know we we remember that um, that that it's these weapons uh, like Lockheed Martin that's producing, which. Um, wag the tail of the dog on both sides of the aisle in the Congress. Um, and, and so these are the, the weapons manufacturers that we have to also continue to go after as we chip at the veneer, as we make more cracks in, 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 in this monstrous system that's creating, uh, perpetrating this genocide. Um, and also, uh, Ariel, would you like to share a bit about tomorrow's, uh, sorry, Thursday's, um, 
ceasefire in Tar. So uh, FOR, we're joining with a number of organizations uh, for Thursday um, to have interfaith iftars for the breaking of Ramadan fast. Um, and as well, Thursday is a Jewish fast day um, across the country. Uh, Susan and I in particular, were working with the mayor of Patterson, New Jersey, which is the uh, largest Palestinian American uh, community in the US. Um, and so we'll be at uh, an iftar hosted by the mayor. But I put the uh, link in the chat as well, because there are, these are happening um, across the country. So I encourage folks to see if there's one near you and uh, to go to it. Um, and so then as we're winding down, I want to um, ask you, May, uh, any advice you have for, for our audience and really like you can get really specific on like organizations uh, that folks should support, calls folks should make, uh, what, do, what do you recommend in, the, in this uh, dark moment? Yeah. I think the, the first thing I would say is listen to Palestinian voices. If you're on Instagram, there are a lot of journalists on the ground that are reporting live from Gaza. Um, if you're not, you know, look away from the mainstream media that's not telling you the full truth. Um, you know, get your news from Al Jazeera and Electronic Intifada and Mondo Weiss um democracy now is okay um yeah continue putting pressure on your elected officials vote uncommitted in the primaries if you're in a place where that is possible um you know follow organizations like the u.s campaign for palestinian rights and jewish voice for peace who in their emails are constantly putting out um, action steps that you can take. Um, Jewish Voice for Peace has a daily 30 minute power hour that you can log on to and get action steps. Um, that's that's the organization that I mostly organize with, which is why I, which is why I keep shouting it out and I'm most familiar with it. Um, but JVP also collaborates with US Campaign for Palestinian Rights and Rising Majority and a lot of other amazing orgs and um, we share we share each other's work. Um, you know, additionally, I would say, please just continue having these conversations. Do not let this conversation die. Um, it will at some point not be in the mainstream media anymore. Do not let this conversation die. Do not let the memories of 31,000 plus martyrs um, be for nothing. Um, you know, in the Jewish tradition, we say, may their memories be for a blessing. Um, and, you know, to that, I would add, may their memories incite the revolution that is necessary for change, for peace, for safety, for liberation, for thriving, for um, for life. Um, so so please join me in um, in doing everything that you can to ensure that um, these these, you know, that the lives that have been that have been martyred are not for nothing. Thank you. So I'll end this with um, giving folks something that that helps lift me in my in my <laughs> dark moments, of which is following you on social media because you get an opportunity to be in the streets with you. So if you can uh, tell us what social media channels you're on and what your uh, handles are. And we'll type them in the chat and I'm gonna encourage folks as well to um, follow your work. Um, yeah, my handles are Radical Rabbi May. Honestly, most of them are private um, for safety. Um, what what do you recommend we follow for, for inspiration that way? Um, yeah, that's actually a good question. See? I mean, I feel like I have a big online footprint just because of, you know, the places my name are. So you can, you know, you can put on a little Google alert for Rabbi May yet. I'm sure I'll pop up from time to time. Um, I don't know. I'm around. I really, I'm, I'm around. Um, 
Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have anything better to share, but I, <laughs> Thank I have you to for keep your... that social media stuff locked down. Thank you for your witness and for your bravery in this time, including the um, the bravery to 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 grapple and to not know and, and to struggle and to to be in pain. And um, thank you for for uh, being involved with Fellowship of Reconciliation this year, and um, we are proud to uh, be lifting up and and supporting your your vital work in these, as I say often, these times that define us. Thank you. And uh, love to to everybody. May we. Uh, get a ceasefire and a just and lasting uh, peace. And I'll end with some good news right before we get off that uh, Canada, which five days ago announced a suspension of non-lethal weapons to Israel has announced um, that they are ceasing uh, the export of any weapons to Israel. So more of that from the world. Have a good night, y'all.